Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome back to episode 32 of the Snarp Fangle podcast. I am your host, Jake Metzger, along with a man who, when he puts on the t-shirt, the only thing he's meant to say, he's a Skinnerd fan. Looking like he got a lot to learn, but from my point of view, he's just a white man coming to you from the North Cali land. Ladies and gentlemen, David Reed. What do you? Th- How are you doing, David? Uh, Why did you take a sip of something right before I pass it along to you? That was a uh, that was a mistake. That on looked my part. like it was a planned mistake. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, um, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Doing okay. All right. Hey, I like what you've done with the place. This looks uh, this looks nice. Our first podcast in the studio. Yes, the official podcast studio mm. of Snart Fangle. Yes, we need to add more purple, but all in due time. And uh, maybe less uh, improvised sound <laughs> treatment and more legitimate sound treatment. <laughs> For a second, you were looking at Steven. I thought you were going to say, and less people. <laughs> I was like, you're going to say so. Anyway, but speaking of, we have a special guest with us, ladies and gentlemen. First time on the Snarp Fangle. This guy is, well, she's going to miss him. When she gets home. But right now, he's at David and Jake's, and he's sitting in the studio. I'm sure it'll hit him when he walks through that door tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Abrun. Hey, what's up? <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> doing good. Uh, as you were reading David's intro, I'm like, is this my intro? And I just started like <laughs> thinking to myself, like, am I a fan of Skinner? <laughs> like, I wasn't sure there. But. Uh, I was, yeah, I was looking up. Uh, I was in a Brad Paisley mood today, and then uh, so I went with I went with Brad Paisley. So, although, yes, she's gonna he's gonna miss her. That was the song. Okay, yeah. So we so we st- I stuck with it. I kept consistency. So anyway, uh, but yeah. Anyway, good greetings, salutations, everybody, and for all your comments, concerns, thoughts, and treatises of Zwinglian eschatology, please direct them to snarpfanglepod at gmail. Dot com. We appreciate you guys taking our time, uh, taking our time, t- taking your time out of the day to listen to our lovely voices. And today, I kind of want to talk about a subject that uh, actually Stephen brought up, brought to our attention, and I'm going to title it just "Being Jesus to Others." And excuse me, before we get started, I kind of want to set the perspective. Um, in the preamble, day, Stephen, you kind of reading off what uh, what I had written down here, so. It was um, basically something I saw on Instagram the other day. Let me not turn on the fan with my foot. Anyway, uh, but it said like um, an inspirational thing where this lady's like folding laundry and it said something like, we always have to clean dishes and wash clothes. And it's something that never really ends. But when you look at it a different way, which is also like the re- in reality, another way you can look at it is we will always have clean dishes and fresh clothes to utilize and put on and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of wanted to read that to kind of just set the tone, set that kind of really ministry and just being good to others is, I mean, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's pretty simple in itself. It's the fact that God is great and he's just so amazing. And he carried that cross for us. And it's kind of like, I just want to set it like in a state of uh, my boss in the, when we're doing the fires of summer, my boss said, you got to stay in a a state of grace, Jake, you know, a state of thankfulness. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And and when you're going through those tough times, like we did, you, you really had to stay positive because it's really easy to not just in fires, but in normal life in general to fall into a a pit of despair um, and just kind of sink in that way. So it's kind of necessary. Yeah, that's true. And I like that story with the, or the analogy, I should say, with the laundry, because um, ministry really is a, uh, it, it's a, it's a constant. future result type yeah. of thing. It's not an immediate result. Mm-hmm. Um, very, very rarely in ministry are you seeing immediate change right in front of your eyes. But a lot of it is planting the seed and sowing what you reap, reaping what you sow. Yeah. And it kind of has to do also with not just with caretaking. Uh, as well, and including like when you're cleaning your dishes or washing your clothes, it also has to do a lot with those that inhabit your space. 
and your home and how you manage your home. And I'm not saying that if you have dirty dishes, you got a bad home. What I'm saying is it's a constant thing where that's always consistent, but it's also an opportunity to present a a good, to be a good steward of your home, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you should go see my room right now. It's not in a state of that at all, (laughs) but when, even when it's messy, you could be like, Oh, I'm, I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for what I have here, even if it's a little messy. So moving on, uh, I wanted to read a couple of verses and then we're going to get into it and I'll pass it over to you, Mr. Uh, Mr. H. So let's do this. So first Timothy six, uh, verses six through eight, this is a English standard version, but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. And that really does speak to kind of what I want to establish here and just what we're going to talk about today for, for the audience listening is we're going to be having some stories and some conversation about what it's like being Jesus to others and ministering or just taking some time to listen to someone or whatever situation it may be. And next I want to read Galatians 5, 22 through 23. This is a new living translation. It says, uh, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in, a, in our lives And those are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these. So, Stephen, I want to, I want you to look at these fruits of the Spirit. Oh, my God! It happened. (laughs) It happened. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'm going to not touch the fan anymore. All right. (laughs) I wonder if the mics are going to pick that up. No, they will. <laughs> That's so scary. I was like, oh, God. It's like a hurricane just came through here. <laughs> anyway, so when you look at these fruits of the Spirit, I kind of want you to take a look at them, and I want you to tell me an example or maybe a story where you utilize one or more of these fruits with someone, um, whatever story comes to mind, and whatever you feel led to share. Like, there's no... Mm. I know I'm pressuring you right now, but really it's like whatever you feel led <laughs> to share. Um, but how have you carried someone else's cross? Well, <clears throat> the a big reason why I wanted to do this theme is because I have been put in situations where people had to know what my beliefs were, not through my words, but through my actions. Um, I've worked at companies before where we weren't allowed to talk about anything religious. Um, in fact, one particular job, I was at a training for it and they said that the number one people, why people, the number one reason why people get fired from this job is showing up drunk or hungover, number one, and number two, talking about religion. Whoa. So it was like from the get go before I even started day one, like at the training, I was told you cannot say the word Jesus in front of people. Um, maybe not in those specific words, but it was very clear to all of us. And you know, come to work drunk and hungover as well as talking about Jesus, just go hand in hand, you know, <laughs> you know all right. the time. But, but those <laughs> showing up drunk and hungover are definitely not fruits of the spirit. No, man. no. <laughs> um, but yeah, the fruits of the spirit, that's a really good passage there showing what you're really made of. Because to tell what kind of tree it is, I mean, sure, a botanist could tell you from the leaves or the veins or whatever, but most people tell what kind of tree it is from the fruit that they see, right? You can tell it's an apple tree if an apple grows on it. Or a pear tree if there's a pear on it. Right. So what kind of tree are we as Christians? It's the type of tree that produces the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. And so in these positions that I've been through and throughout my life, whether it is a strictly don't talk about religion scenario, or if it is a scenario of ministry is you have to show people who you are through these actions. You have to be able to have patience with them when the rest of the world does not, you have to be able to show them joy in their interests when Others might think it's weird, right? Um, I spent uh, quite a few years in youth ministry, uh, running a youth group 
in our church. What? Uh, no way. <laughs> I don't know if the, the viewers are uh, following along with uh, what church it was, but yeah, I, 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 was, I, was, I was the youth leader for a lot of years, and um, a lot of the relationship building with teens is, you know, being a listening ear, showing them that patience, um, being willing to love them through whatever mistakes they might make or whatever they might admit to you that they're feeling, say like, Hey man, I love you anyway. Or showing them, you know, uh, the peace that's inside of you. Right. Uh, when they're stressing out and freaking out about the world and this math test and their parents and getting grounded and what Cheetos they have in the pantry, having that peace that just like envelops around you is, um, something that's really cool. And it's really, apparent that's something that's really seen especially by these teenagers i found who might be struggling in life yeah and and i mean being a teenager ain't easy i mean you're kind of it's literally transitioning to an adult i remember when um for the audience I, me and steven led the youth group for quite a few years in fact david was a youth leader at at one moment in the past and currently is as well um but yeah we were I led it with you and, and you led it with me and all this stuff. And we kind of experienced that together. And it was, and you did it way before me. I mean, you, you, you're older than me. And so you got in, you got in there and led the whole group. Just barely. You know, just barely. I'm not an old man yet. <laughs> no, no. But anyway, um, not yet. <laughs> but anyway, um, I remember I would always tell the kids, I said, you're turning into the person you're, you're transitioning into the person you're going to be the rest of your life and the decisions you make, especially 16 and on all the way up through your twenties is going to define the kind of person you're going to be for the literally the rest of your life. So if you're going to make poor decisions, if you're going to succumb to whatever wills life offers you or the world does, that's going to be the rest of your life. And I'm not saying people can't change, but there are some establishment foundation level things that are established at that age. I mean, kids are like a sponge and they just soak up whatever they, whatever they're offered really, especially when they're younger, but especially when they're teenagers. I mean, we live in a time now in modern internet days, modern technology where like I read it on the internet, so it must be true. Or oh, my favorite influencer talked about it and that's his opinion. So that's my opinion too, you know? So it's like, they're very susceptible. Uh, they, you know, or a lot, a lot of people are not just teenagers. But anyway, I think you bring up a good point because it's also a very, like, I guess I would use the word like tender age, like where you're still figuring stuff out, and even in your twenties, you're feeling you're figuring stuff out. It doesn't end, um, but it, it's just you're getting used to the body. You're figuring all this stuff out, and what always stood out to me with them is the frankness of children and the honesty, even if it was like, Hey, how was your day? Oh, I went and did this. And my mom yelled at me and then this happened. And then <laughs> all this stuff. Yeah. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What else, what else happened? You know? And then it's just really listening. I think because you can't as a youth minister, as a pastor, as even a friend, you can't fix their issues. You never will maybe, but you can listen and you can be, you can give them the time of day. And cause not a lot of kids really do get that. Right. So mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, do you have any specific like examples I would say that come to mind? Just, I mean, you don't have to be caught. You can be confidential if you want. I mean, say whatever you please. Uh, can I give you an example of when I felt that from someone else for me? Yeah, go for it. Um, the when I was a kid in youth group, when Thad was the youth pastor, um, like at, at the time, I wasn't uh, aware of the world enough to real <laughs> to to analyze other people's conversations or whatever you call it. But I'm saying this in hindsight. Um, one thing that I really admire in how Thad led his youth ministry and how he forms connections and relationships to this day is he's the kind of person who truly cares about everything that you say, right? 
I'm guilty, just I'm sure as a lot of other people are, of hearing someone complaining about their day and thinking like, oh, all right, I have somewhere to be. Like, when's this going to end? Like, wrap <laughs> it up here. Like, not invested in it at all. But there were a lot of times as a 11, 12, 13-year-old in youth group that I would say something to Thad just in passing, it, I felt like. And, you know, a week later, he would see me again and say, oh, hey, how did that math quiz go? I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, I did talk to you about a math quiz. Like, I'm, I'm surprised you remembered that. Like, and, and it was one of those things that, you know, is, is a little thing to, you know, truly be invested in what people are telling you at the time. But it made a ton of difference in my life thinking that, hey, there's someone here who cares about what I have to say, who isn't annoyed by what I'm saying or isn't burdened by what I'm struggling with, but who truly cares and is invested in me. Yeah, and I remember you told a story one time about something like that with that. And what really stood out to me was like, yeah, like the follow up, but also like the consistency. Like you don't even see you don't see him just treat you that way, but other kids as well. And what, David? What's the term of the? Uh, you know what? I forgot what it was. Never mind. But <laughs> I think the goal, the what I was trying, what I'm trying to say is like uh, the Holy Spirit really doesn't have any prejudice at all, and there's no um, what's it called? There's no special treatment when the with God, because we are all his children. And I think that's a really beautiful example. So that was one thing that, how you experienced that, an example of somebody taking that time and investing in you. What is an example of you doing that for somebody else? Hmm. Let's see. Um, gosh, like I said, ministry is always a... Uh, plant the seed now and see the fruit later. And so it's hard to really pinpoint, you know, exact strategies that I might have. I, I don't want to say strategies. <laughs> like I, I'm not moving around chess pieces here, but uh, you know, it, it's hard to pinpoint with, you know, what exactly my actions, what, what those effects are in my teens later down the road. Well, let me ask you this. What's the motivation? What's the goal of you come to youth group Saturday you, the kids are getting dropped off or you pick them up. And then what's the goal behind every conversation while you're there? Like, why are you doing youth ministry? I think we need to establish that before we move on. Like, what? where does your heart lie in that? That's good. Um, for me personally, my heart lies in doing good in what God has trusted me with. Um. I feel on an almost daily basis incredibly humbled and grateful for the trust that God has put in me with my ministry for so long. Um, there's a lot of times that I'm praying to God and I'm thinking like, God, like you're trusting me with the faith of these 20 some odd teenagers <laughs> like, and, and I understand that God has a good and perfect will and he will work all things towards good, but it's still such a like awe-inspiring feeling of the creator of the universe and the father of all humans trusting you with their children and saying, no, Stephen, you're doing a good job. And I believe that you hold their future in their hands. So for me, doing youth ministry um, is, it, it's always humbling because, you know, call it imposter syndrome or whatever, um, it always feels like, wow, like God can save this person's life so much better than I can. What, what, what am I even supposed to do here? But at the same time, it's a, you know what, I know a God that is so good, that is so amazing that I want to show a little bit of that in every interaction I give to others. Um, I want to have every conversation, every interaction, every, a, a, every time I see someone to have them walk away seeing that, yeah, I love God and 
I trust him with my life and I love him and he loves you and we're all in this together. Yeah. Um, David, I feel like you have something to add. At Do this I? Point. I? I think so. Do I? I Are so. you sure about that? I just call it a feeling. Just call it a feeling. Um, you'll have to come back because okay, I'm, not come back. I, I, <laughs> I'm not feeling that same feeling. I'm not feeling that same feeling. And I'll, also, you should probably not touch that fan anymore. Sorry, I just, <laughs> I want to use a stool with my feet so bad. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking. There, stop touching it. Um, yeah, it's kind of a scary thought being like, oh man, I'm entrusted with all these children around me and not just like, like other parents, kids, but like God's children too. And it's, um, it's a scary, it's a scary feeling, honestly. And I think that, I think that, I think for me, the, I'll come back to myself and tell my, my, my kind of side of it. But I think that what comes to mind for me is really, um, the need that needs to be filled. I mean, I remember when, like Thad was uh, stepping away from the youth group after years and years and years, like 15, 20 years. And then he passed it along to you. And then I think a couple others as well. Uh, um, and then it was really interesting to see that uh, transition because I'm not talking just strictly leadership. I'm talking about the heart and where the hearts are of leaders. And I think a reason, a lot of reason those people were there were for the kids. And you see a need in our community specifically for the children and how important they are, especially when, and I'm not trying to call any churches out here by saying this, but there are a lot of churches that don't have a younger population, that don't have an age range that young. Like most of them are in the older, uh, you know, 30 plus, 40 plus years old. And to have children around is to have life around. And... I think it was really we our church was in a unique position all those years to have so many kids around and teenagers who are willing to help and volunteer, but also for people who are there to willing to minister to them and treat them like human beings, not just, oh, you're just another kid at the school that I gotta help teach. <laughs> you know? It's like uh, or another another head of thirty heads in a class, you know, it's like there's more to it than that. And and it's so beautiful to see that heart. And I see it in our church today and your church as well. And I just, I see it in you. I see it in David. I see it in a lot of folks. And it, that humbles me too, because I'm like, wow, like where does my heart have to lie for that and and everything? But it's really about listening to the Holy Spirit, I would say. And, you know, for me, it was mostly a need, but I'm going to go on that later. So, um in terms of where your heart uh, is and was, you kind of do that now with your your daily job now as yeah. well. Not like ministering, but like you're spending your time and you're investing. Yeah, right now I'm working at the local elementary school. And um, uh, specifically, I, I help out during the day too, but specifically my main role is with the after school program uh, from dismissal until 6 p.m. And... Um, you know, it's it's a completely different dynamic when uh, the kids have this expectation on them of how to behave and, you know, don't break the rules and all this stuff. And, yeah, dur during the after-school program, we still have rules, but, you know, it's, it's a lot more um, – it's a lot more relationship building. It's a lot, it feels a lot more like a family when it's the after-school program and it's not, you know – learn this curriculum, let's get going, <laughs> mm -hmm. stay on task. Um, it's more like, so, don't beat that kid up. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, come on, guys. We don't hang upside down from the toilet. Like <laughs> <laughs> The toilet? That's a, might have happened. <laughs> um, I'm sure it has. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I, I feel like... Um, my main responsibility are the older kids, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. So these are kids from uh, like eleven to thirteen, that sort of range, and um, those are the 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 same ages that we were talking about with the very uh, uh, susceptible to 
um, what, what was the word he uh, used? Influence. Uh, in, in, yeah, he's easily influenced. Easily influenced. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've had a lot of kids come up to me and say like, "Hey, Mister Bruin, like, I really like being in your class, and I don't know why, but it's, it's really fun being in here." I'm just like. Well, thanks, bud. Uh, I, I want to say, like, you know, that's Jesus, right? And you know, it's one of those times. I'm just like, ah, like I, I, I'm so glad that you're feeling this love right now, and I'm so glad that, you, in some small way, you've uh, you got a glimpse of God's goodness. And at the same time, there's you know times I want to do more, but I know that the little things. Are, are the seeds that are being planted. I keep going back to the planting the seeds um, metaphor. And um, I, I just think it's so applicable when we're talking about planting the seeds of Jesus in lives. Like these are the moments that people are going to look back on when they're adults and think, man, like my after school program teacher, he was a really cool guy. Like I wonder what he's doing now. And What's he up to? That sort of thing. And it might lead towards something bigger in the future. And that's what I'm hoping for. I agree. I think it's really cool because, man, you never really know who. I always tell this to, um, I don't know, whenever I'm preaching, I guess. I don't know. But the one thing that always stood out to me is you never truly know who's watching you or who's looking up to you or who sees you in a certain light. Like you never really know who's watching you. And the reason why I say that that way is because when I was in youth group, back when we were teenagers, I remember I was like, I would hold out my hands during worship or whatever. Like, you know, do do the halvesies. I wanted to put them above my head, but I put them in front of me, you know, and I would use that. So I'd worship be like, I'm doing the Lord's work. But anyway, jokes aside, I would, that's how I'd worship. And I remember one time I, I opened my eyes, we were at the friend's church and I noticed off to the side, I was like, whoa, a couple kids were doing the same thing. And I've never, ever seen them do that or even like worship standing up, no less. And I was like, oh, oh that's kind of crazy. And, I, and hindsight, it's probably the Holy Spirit moving. But at that time, I was like, oh, maybe they're doing it because I'm doing it. I don't know. And that kind of made me check myself and be like, oh, maybe I should, you know, not only my behavior, but also like those guys maybe look up to me and some of them were even older. And I was like, Ooh, that's kind of weird. But it stuck in my mind where I'm like, there's like people who I felt like they like needed me or they were, it was good for them to be around me and I could be that for them. And that was kind of the start of the thought of being a leader and being there for others is, is kind of living more than for yourself. And as a teenager, that's what the thought process was. Now it's more complicated, but that was the, what was going through my mind. And I remember when I one was, had the decision to leave the youth group when I turned 18, uh, cause that's how it worked in our youth group. You, if you turn 18, you have a choice to become a volunteer and then maybe a leader later on, or, but you have to help out. You know, that's what you're, if you want to keep coming, you have to help out volunteer or you just don't, don't come because that's, it's up to you. You know, those are the choices you're given. And I remember I stuck around, did the volunteer thing and then became a leader. And I did it because there was two specific guys, um, that I saw that needed, I felt like needed guidance and I felt like I could be that for them. And that was where my heart was. And then even after they left, I was like, oh my gosh, there's even more kids here that could definitely use that. And then that just kept going on. And I remember that was my mind process when that first started and I couldn't, it was kind of a thing I never really thought of before. And, you know, being, I guess being Jesus to others, but I want to pass it along to you, David, because I have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, what it produces over here, the produce of the Holy Spirit over here. The Holy Spirit's produce. Yes, the Holy Spirit produce, man. Do you cool get that, that from the uh, the Holy Spirit produce section? Yeah, it's cooled at a nice 42 degrees, man, <laughs> Fahrenheit. And <laughs> I don't know why I said it that way. Fahrenheit, suck it outside the U.S. <laughs> anyway, be like Jesus, you know. <laughs> so, David, I'm going to pass it along to you. I want you to share us something, whatever you feel led to share. It could be short, long, high, low, whatever got ye song you want to recall to your mind. It could be whatever you want, whatever you feel led to be. But what specifically in here 
what kind of fruit have you seen and how does that relate to some like experience story or even that your time as a leader uh, or even just in life in general, where have you had to carry somebody else's cross? Mm, that's a difficult question. Or be Jesus to others. We'll that's start a, that's we'll start a difficult there. question because I'm, uh, you know, I do my best. I, uh, <laughs> in every situation, <laughs> in every situation, I'm like, um, you know, I, uh, I try to be attentive in every situation to the leading of the, the spirit. And I try to, um, I can't remember. Blech, the the but, word just uh-oh. went right out of my mind. I, I saw it flying away and I wanted to say something, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, it seems like you interrupted yourself. No, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> And I try in every situation to behave in in such a way where, you know, that uh, somebody, that my, uh, you know, my faith is more than just words. Um, I guess it's hard to say that, it's hard to say anything, like, call to mind anything specific. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, I don't think about it that way. Because it's like, you know... You know, we all have, we all see ourselves in, in different ways and, um, you know, and we all have, we all have our own individual distortions of ourselves, uh, you know, that sometimes it takes another person pointing, pointing something out for us. To, oh, that's actually, oh, I wasn't seeing that clearly. So one of, one of the things that I, I always, um, that is just I'm always dealing with is like 100% all the time, every situation, it doesn't matter what happened. I generally feel like I was a jackass, <laughs> 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 which is, Oh, David, no, I know it's a, don't, it's, it's not, it's, I don't, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. It's just <laughs> no pity for the, no David. pity for the read. It's, um, it's, it's just something that's just a thing, you know, and I try to not see myself in that way, but inevitably I, I ended up doing. So it's like, I can't really give you a situation which I was Jesus to somebody else because I'm looking at it through my own lens. Um, you know, but I have, there have been situations where somebody's, um, well, before you go, can I bring up something real quick about sober mindedness? And I think that's something that you practice real well. So, in First Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversity, the devil prowls around like a brawling lion seeking someone to devour. And I think for you, you always, from what I've noticed from just behavior-wise, you always seem to have that just chill demure, as the kids would say, about you, where the um, you're like always ready to do whether it be worship or whatever, but you're kind of very consistent in that. And you're always like, I think the word I would find is you're always ready to do the will of God from what I've seen and just in your behavior. So maybe you don't have a specific example, but I've seen behavior from you and you know, no, nobody's perfect. We all mess up, you know, sure. But I remember uh, there was always times in youth group whether you you were a leader or we were just hanging out or whatever, where David is always kind of consistent and he's always like got a good head on his shoulders. And that's how I would describe you. You always would be, even though you're very much a very fine whiskey, whiskey connoisseur, it's always, a, you've always been super sober minded in the spirit, I would say. And yeah, that's just something I wanted to point out to you, man. But yeah, yeah. continue. What would you have? I, what'd you I, got? I, what you got? Um, but yeah, so I don't have any specific examples, but there have been times where people have come up to me like, um, you know, just like not big things, but just like little things where it's like, oh, you know, you know, the, whether it was youth ministry or leading worship or whatever, whatever it was, you know, I've had people come up to me and it's like, you know, this little thing of, you know, that was meaningful to me. And so it's like, you know, 
but it's like it's one of those things where it's like I'm just I'm never aware of it in the moment. <laughs> I'm like trying to do my best. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm not super like, oh, I'm planting a seed right here, <laughs> you know? It's like not uh, that not that other people yeah. are like that, but no, I'm no, no, no. I'm definitely yeah. not like that. <laughs> <laughs> um it's just like it's it's always I'm just in any situation, I'm trying to uh I'm trying to do the will of God however I can whether it's a small way or a big way. And most of the time, I don't find out whether I did that or not until way, way later. Yeah, and that's um, that's another thing I want to bring up too because a lot of the stuff we or the, that people who are in ministry have do, you don't see the fruit of that forever. And it could be 40 years down the line. Like I, I remember there's so many examples in, uh, where I like – totally messed up and like helping somebody out, whether it be a kid at youth group or like just somebody else I knew. And I was like, I should not have said that. Oh, I messed up really bad and I shouldn't have said that, you know? And, but the reason why you shouldn't worry about that and the reason why you shouldn't worry about, am I doing enough for the community or whatever is kind of like what I said before, you don't know who's watching you because it takes a lot of courage for somebody to go up to somebody and say, Hey, you inspire me or something. Also, it's like not really socially like done a whole lot in our society. So it's not really a normal thing at all. Um, and I think that you, the stuff that we not need to worry about is the fruits because we know that as long as we're doing what the Holy spirit is calling us to do in our life at this very moment, then as long as we do God's will, we're okay. And he can worry about the rest because that's part of what submission is when you give it to him. And in that scenario, in that season you're in and you give it to him and you say, Hey Lord, this is yours. And just let me be a tool of your using. Um, that really is where a lot of good comes from and whether, and, and again, one more thing I'll bring up when you're helping people out or ministering to them or whatever, it's up to them to accept it. And it's up to them. I mean, I can think of countless kids throughout the years who I invested in and I poured time into and all this other stuff. And, you know, I look at them now and I'm like, oh, man, uh, their life kind of sucks. You know? <laughs> or, they, or, <laughs> or they made some bad decisions <laughs> or like other stuff. I'm not trying to say that. <laughs> what I'm saying is, um, Stephen, what I'm saying, what am I saying? <laughs> I, I think it's the, the fruit discussion we were talking about and uh, planting seeds, but not necessarily being the person to water or provide something. Well, yeah, to, I, I kind of, you know. <laughs> all joking aside, all I kinda, joking aside, I kind of, their life sucks. I kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of picking up what you're putting down there. Um, Cause yeah, it's, you can pour all the time and effort um, into someone's life that you want. Um, and ultimately, whether or not they, um, whether or not they uh, take that and turn to God as a result of it, mm. is totally up to them. Totally. And I mean, sometimes it takes people a while, yep. and but ultimately it's up to them. And it's like it's, but at the same time, it's like it's easy to feel like you're wasting your efforts when you do that. But, I mean, that's how the Lord is with us. You know, He's con the Holy Spirit is constantly drawing on us. Um, I mean, you know, Christ came to earth and died for the world. Mm -hmm. And not the whole world's not going to choose to, uh, to, accept, to accept what he did for them, you know. But he did it, he paid the price just the same. So it's like, um, it doesn't feel good when you see, you know, someone you poured time into, like, you know, totally walking away from the Lord. But at the same time, it's like, this is just part of being Jesus to the world is sometimes you're not always going to, people are not always going to be uh, receptive to what you have to give them. Right. I'm sure uh, Jesus felt a lot of that too with the uh, Pharisees of his time. 
Because he loved them just as much as all the others that he saved. And he preached to them just as much as the others that he saved. And even Jesus in the flesh here on earth still struggled with, you know, if the heart isn't ready, the heart isn't ready. Yeah, well, what was the what was the guy that he healed at the, the pool or whatever at the... Uh, he healed that one guy at the pool and then he was healed. He wasn't cripple anymore. He could walk around. And so he's like, oh, I'm going to go get on some of this party happening in the temple, you know? And so he went over there and ran into Jesus and he's like, what are you doing here? And he's like, oh, I'm just getting on some of this fruit in this fruit basket or whatever he was doing. And he's like, okay, but what else are you going to do like after this? I don't remember the exact wording or anything or how the story went, but it was something to the extent of like, Hey man, now that you've been healed, how are you going to respond to that? And how are you go- are you going to change your lifestyle now that you know, this huge blessing is provided to you? How are you going to continue on with that? Are you going to have the same mindset as a cripple? Are you still going to walk around? You know, it's I th- I think of like the people I grew up uh, around where that when Thad was leading and I was a little, little kid and I see them like on Facebook or whatever, and I see them living their lives, but I'm like, you know what? I don't think Thad's worried about if he made a big difference in their lives. I think what, I mean, cause you never know 40 years down the line, they could think back and they're like, Oh, I remember that one sermon that one guy gave, or I remember that one word that really spoke to me. And, or there may be in a, a moment of, despair and they they're looking for hope and then they remember those hopeful moments and i think that's part of listening to the holy spirit and being a good minister is to provide those peaceful moments to others and just being jesus to others um i know for me i have a uh i know i wanted to share a story where because i work in uh, education as well and and i work in the, the college education space and you know, just a small little community college, and I've been there for a couple of years. And I mean, let me tell you, there's so many times I've seen where students like come in and they ask for help with tech stuff. And I mean, when I first got hired there, there's a lady that brought me her computer, and she tried to re- tried to recover a file, and the file was completely gone. Like the the, the recycle bin was bin was wasted, and there's no way I could get it back. And so. I kind of failed my very first day, very first encounter with somebody because I couldn't like provide, I couldn't help fix their problem. Um, but that, but that kind of like kind of set the course of being like, Oh, well, let me, well, you know, I failed in this, but what else could I have you? So I, you know, I recommended her use OneDrive and all this other stuff she could fix and, and to help her along the way. And there's plenty of people I've worked with where I never see their face again. And, when you do, it's a real happy moment, but there's so many people I've helped with. I've never seen them at all a second time in my life. And, you know, in that short time I'm with them, whether it be 15 minutes or an hour, it's, you kind of just want to, I always just try to be the best I can in every scenario. It's sometimes easier, sometimes harder, but that's just, that's how I was raised and that's how, you know, I've been taught to do things. But even in the college scenario where you're not supposed to talk about God, like you said, Stephen, it's a great practice place of kind of acting out what Jesus would be and just being Jesus to others. And also and try not to, because there was a point in my life where I was like, really like, oh yeah, I'm doing the Lord's work or doing the good, <laughs> doing the good work. But it's like, you got to be careful too, because that could be prideful and, and you don't want to do that. But I want to give you guys an opportunity um, if it comes to your memory or if you want to share whatever you're comfortable with of a time you were able to help somebody out and do that for that person. And I'll start with me. I, I was helping this old lady out. She's a great gal, but she didn't even use, know how to like type on a keyboard. And I was like, okay, this is going to be some work. <laughs> but, and this was right before COVID hit. So she started in like 2019 and I was in the computer lab with her and I was helping her out and she just was like, all right, well, I'm just going to keep working at this. And I showed her how to use the keyboard and she, I showed her like typing websites and just stuff she could do outside the lab as well. And she still had to work on her assignments. So she tried her best navigating the computer. She's an older lady. And now she like four or five years later, she graduated, 
went through COVID and all the Zoom meetings and everything and worked through that and got like a degree and, and all this other kind of stuff. And she pointed me and my supervisor out during that time how we really, truly helped her out in all aspects. And it was really humbling to be like, whoa, okay, I'm making a difference around here. And, and um, it was just really like eye-opening to be like, wow, I've kind of made a difference. And, you know, typing, that's like super simple to me, but it's really a struggle for that person. And I remember there's one thing Thad said this summer that really stood out to me. He said, being a good parent is being what your children need in that moment. Doesn't mean you need to, uh, you know, be easy on them. It's being what they need. So if they need discipline, if they need a loving, well, they always need a loving father, but if they, whatever they need in that moment, in that time of their life, you need to be that, provide that for them. As a parent, that's your duty. And I know for me, this job has been a great, like, opportunity to learn that kind of stuff and to, you know, uh, not, not be a parent, but kind of practice doing that. Cause I know for my kids, it's definitely a great thing to practice for patients. Cause when I have kids, I know, I know how I grew up. I wasn't a very patient child. So I'm going to have to learn a lot of patience for my kids when they come along. So anyway, but, uh, yeah, that lady just kept going and she's still doing stuff today and finding work and all this stuff. And, it was just a huge success story and I wasn't like ever prepared. Like I went to her graduation and she was in her graduation garb and everything. And it was just really, uh, really cool. So y'all got any, uh, maybe not, not even like, cause there's been plenty of times where I'm like failed and this person just doesn't succeed at all. Like during that, like semester after she graduated, there was a lady that just, could not figure out how to get her classes done and just had super severe learning disabilities that I assisted as much as I could. And I just couldn't help her. She just had to drop out near the end of the semester and it just felt bad for her. Cause I'm like, Oh man, but this is life. Things happen. So, you know, just do your best in what situation presents it to you. Is that one of those, is that one of those situations where, uh, you uh, you looked at it and you're like, man, their life sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it's> just... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, um, man. But, David, Stephen, do you, uh, do you get any examples like that or really stuff that stands out in your life that you would like to share with the Snarf Angles? Yeah. I feel like one of the recent times I feel like it really made a difference with someone – um, was at the elementary school that I'm working at. Uh, there was one student who was having a really hard time with school life, with, you know, relationships and stuff like that. And it got to the point that he was getting in trouble every single day. There wasn't, you know, a two day span where he wasn't in the principal's office that he wasn't getting written up or sent on the wall or, and call home to parents or something. And he was getting to a point that he was fed up with it all. He was getting aggressive. He was getting angry. He was getting, and all of this is justifiably so, you know, as a kid and he was a, I believe a fifth grader at the time, um, as a kid who is constantly told you're not enough, they're going to live that way. Either they're going to live like they're, they're going to live in a sadness knowing that they're not enough or they're going to lash out and make themselves enough in the wrong ways. Um, but this particular student um, happened to see me one day with a Rubik's cube in my hand. And that's not one thing that I like to do with the after school program is every now and then I'll bring something from home that, you know, I know how to do and here, let me, let me show whoever's interested in it and whatever else. So I brought a Rubik's Cube and I, had, I was flocked by little kids who would scramble it up and they would twist it like five times and say, oh, you can't solve this one. This is way too hard for you, Mr. Hebrun. Or I made this one impossible, Mr. Hebrun. You can't do it. And I'm like, here you go. There. Done. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the, this one boy who was really struggling with school, um, 
I, I could tell like he was immediately like interested, like, whoa, I've never seen a Rubik's cube solved, let alone see one get solved in my face, like in under a minute. And that is, whoa, that, that's cool. And, um, you know, he would scramble it up a couple times and I would solve it for him. And he, he, I could tell that, you know, the look in his eyes was a lot different than any other time I see him around campus. Um, and, um, what ended up happening was, uh, he would stay after school. He wasn't part of the after school program, but he would stay after school and like ask his mom to stay after, or he would come up to me during lunch times and say like, Hey, can you teach me one part of the Rubik's cube? Like, don't teach me how to do the whole thing, but can you teach me just this step? And then can you teach me this step? And Hey, I saw you do this. Like, how did you do that? And you know, I was in a really cool position where I wasn't, I, I, w I was a person of authority working at the school, obviously, but I wasn't one that he yet resented. I was still new to the school at this point, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> and so um, I, I really took that as an opportunity to, you know, not think about any of the history that I've heard about this kid or what I've seen him do two hours ago. But Hey, in this moment, I have a boy who is super interested and is really attentive and willing to learn something. And I want to teach him. And so I'm able to put away anything extraneous and just pour into him and with kindness and with grace and um, with patience, I, I taught him how to solve a Rubik's cube. And, um, you know, at first it's, uh, he's asking for help every step of the way. And with time he was able to, you know, memorize what he's doing and know what he's doing. But what ended up happening was this kid for the rest of the time he was at the school, he ended up teaching other kids how to solve Rubik's cubes. He even started a club at the school. He started a cult? Hey. <laughs> He started a club. A club. club. Okay. I didn't hear the B in there. Um, he started a club at the school, and we even bought like a 20 pack of Rubik's Cubes for all the kids Whoa, that wanted to come to it. Dang. And he gave up his lunch to be around other kids and teach them this cool thing that he knows. And like, and I keep thinking back to the look in his eyes of like a complete 180 of how he's feeling in the classroom versus how he's feeling here. And, um, he, he's not at the school anymore, but I still see him around. He's still a local kid. And every time I do, he goes, Hey, Mr. Abrun, how's it going? And he, he'll tell me about a cool new crazy Rubik's cube that he has that twists in 16 different directions. And I'm like, that's okay. awesome, man. Like, that, that's really cool. Like how you, how, and it's, again, just, you know, investing him and showing him that he's important. Hey, how's, how, how's it going? Like, how's school going? And what grade are you in now? And like, how are your grades doing? And, you know, even if he's struggling, he's, you know, knowing that you've made a difference in any aspect is a great feeling. Yeah. And, and that's a really cool story. Yeah. I think it's pretty neat. It's a thing. I know the kid you're talking about, but man, that's really, he's a smart kid asking you, how do you do this step and this step? Mm -hmm. Not like his were not asked that. So no. that's pretty cool. And then like for him to, ah, man, that, that's awesome, dude. Like just that, like that look too. It's like, oh, dude. Like it clicks, and that's really awesome, man. That's cool. Um, speaking, going back to the sober mind in this thing, I want to kind of dive into a discussion about that real quickly. Here, well, not real quickly. We can take as long as we want, but I want to read First Peter again. First Peter five eight it says, "Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. So he's loud and very. It makes it very obvious he's around, seeking someone to devour." I want to read this quote by Bill Johnson, and it has to do with creativity, but I want to tie it in and how it applies to this. He says this. He says, do you know why people lose the ability to think creatively? It's because they carry so many things in anxiety in their mind. So many details to try to remember, too many problems to try to fix, so many things they fear. And that's the enemy's attempt to disengage us from our assignment and privilege to create to represent him, God, well with creative, fresh ideas. And that is anxiety and fear that kills that in us. So there was one time 
when I was helping my dad, and he's like, all right, we'll meet this time and go help fix some fences. I need your help. And I was like, okay, sure. And I ate like a full course dinner before I went out there. And I was like, I instantly regret it. I was slow, sluggish, and I, all this like, it was just the worst decision of my life. I'm sure I've made worse decisions, but I don't, you know, it's a bad decision. Anyway. Um, so I want to bring that up because we, we got to be careful. We should be careful uh, what we put into our minds and our bodies because there's a time when we learn how our bodies act and react to things. And like the example I gave, like if I'm going to go out in the field to do some work, I'm not going to go eat a full course dinner before I go out there because I won't be to my full potential. And I kind of want to know what you guys think of that and how you've counteracted that throughout the years and learning how to feed your spirit and get ready for a day. But also like life happens and there's not really much preparation for anything when you wake up in the morning. Let me be real. But there are definitely ways to mitigate that. There was a time where I would be in the computer lab and I get real like short with somebody and I'm like, why am I getting short? Like I caught myself and I'm like, what, what, why is this happening? Why am I really impatient right now? And there's been plenty of people that have, you know, tested my patience, but like for some reason today is like, I'm shorter. And I was like, why? And what my mom would say to me growing up is, oh yeah. Oh, and I would get short with her. She'd be like, oh yeah, I could tell you're not reading enough of your Bible every morning. And I was like, damn. Okay. Called she out. caught me out. So but I think it's um, poignant because when we do our job and be like Christ, which is which literally what Christian means, we use our creative brains in doing that, whether it be navigating a conversation, whether it be talking to somebody, or heck, it even could be body language or listening to the Holy Spirit and trying to be in tune to what he wants you to do. Um and the weekends when church is happening and then the weekdays when church isn't happening in all aspects of your life, whether it be relationships with your significant other or your family or the kids you work with at school. So, or your coworkers and all this kind of stuff. So I kind of want to know what your guys' opinion on that is and how, I don't know. What do you guys think of that? <laughs> what do you think of uh, God giving us this gift of, spiritual creativity to kind of be his ministers. Well, I will say, I will say that, um, a creative creativity is a good word to a good way to frame it is because you're never going to know what situation life is going to thrust you into and when. Mm -hmm. So really the only preparation for life situations you can do uh, come down to being consistent in spending time in the Word, spending time with the Lord, um, being intentional about how you spend your time, um, and basically what that... I mean, it's... Sometimes, you know, you, you get up and it's like, you know, I could you know, reading the Bible feels like, you know, you know, feels like homework is, I mean, it's not supposed to feel like homework because you're, you're spending time with God, but sometimes it does because we're, we're fallible. Um, you know, so that's just, sometimes it feels like homework, but it's like, um, in those times it's important to be consistent because that's where you draw your strength from in situations where, uh, you have to think on your feet. You have to think creatively because that's what life is. It's going to throw you into a situation that you didn't expect and you have to figure out some way of dealing with it. And the resources that you have to do that all stem from what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, how you spend your time, what you uh, what you feed yourself with, all that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, one thing I was thinking about earlier as we were talking just now was that um, Jake and I being in the position of working at schools and me with kids in summer camps and stuff like that, we feel a lot of external pressure to keep Jesus out of the conversation, right? Oh, yeah. 
Uh, we have <laughs> we have bosses and we have procedures and we have policies that keep it out of the conversation. Whereas, David, stop me if I'm wrong, but I feel like a lot of pressure for you and your work is more cultural, and it's a lot of internal pressure. Um, there's you know, and this is with a lot of people too, you know, in the workplace or at school or wherever you are in your life. Um, everywhere you go, there's going to be internal pressure to fit in or to act a certain way or to behave this way. And if, you know, being a good Christian doesn't align with that peer pressure and that external pressure, it gets really hard and it, it, it takes a lot of discipline and a lot of self-control like those fruits of the spirit we were talking about to hold on to your beliefs because i think that's what you were talking about too david like um being ready yeah being ready and being sure of what your beliefs are well also the with the sober mind in this kind of thing is it's not more about what you put in or anything but it's like what you what david was saying being ready for when the opportunity arises and I know for us, uh, you know, we work in this, but, uh, you know, and David, you work in that, but I think the sober minus thing applies to, to literally everybody in the body, whether you are this foot or this hand or whatever, you know, it always applies. And it's, uh, it's, it's interesting just thinking about like God providing the things for us to, and the, and literally the word and the instruction manual of how to do all this. And, I don't know. I just, it's just, I, I wanted to bring it up because it's like, it boggles my mind because I'm like, huh, you know, I want to, um, uh, through the fires this summer, my boss, Mario, was like, oh, you know what? I do this and this and this, and this is how I work on the fire. And this is like, I, he got it down to like a science, his routine through the day. Like, all right, when I get back to camp, when I eat dinner, do my cleanup, or clean up, eat dinner, and then go to bed. And that worked out really well for him. And I found out it worked well for me. And then when I broke that routine, I found out it didn't really, like, it really kind of hindered my ability to sleep well or whatever. So I know we're all, like, routine creatures and everything, but I bring that up because if you have your mind on something else during that time while you're trying to, excuse me, fight the fires or anything like that or distracted, distractions, which this world is plenty full of, you, you have to just bring it back and center yourself around Christ. And I think... Through renew, the daily renewing of your mind. Like last night when I was uh, about to go to bed, it was like 1130 or something. And I like immediately started thinking of all the stuff to write about for our podcast tonight. And I was like, oh man, I was write about this and all this. And I was inspired by that. And then like I, by the time I knew it, it was like two o'clock. I'm like, oh my God, I got to go to bed. But it's like, I don't know, sometimes uh, like the holy creativity kind of hits you and you're kind of like, or any creativity hits you and you're just uh, ready to go. But I feel like the Lord in, I don't know why I keep going back to creativity through all of our snarp angles, but I feel like God has a heavily influence or heavily um, has a heavy weight in your uh, creative ability. And I feel like some people really realize that and their potential. And some people are just, um, and then they live a life of Christ, but then some people don't. But sometimes they're just stupid creative. I mean, just look at Freddie Mercury. He wasn't really a Christ-like figure, but dang, that man could sing. I mean, imagine if he was saved. And that is some thought I've always kind of kept with me. And I don't know where I'm going in this conversation, but it's just something I found interesting. And uh, I just was wondering what you guys think. And I think, David, you kind of hit it on the point where it's to be at the ready. I'm sure there's a verse. Is there a verse where it says like that in term- somewhere? In the Bible, I just don't remember it right now. Are you talking about in Ephesians where they're talking about the armor of God? Stand ready against the enemy? Yes. I think you're right. I guess. I mean, I, ready, I'd have to pull it up if I'm going to quote it. But. Readiness is a, is a common theme in Scripture. True. Um, like, I mean, the, the Scripture you quoted about um, be sober and vigilant because you're enemy of the d- devil's prowling around like a roaring lion you know that's all about readiness yeah. like it's i mean that that just goes back to the idea it's like we don't know what life is going to throw at us so we always have to be um it's a, it's a cliche but i mean 
essentially we got to expect the unexpected kind of a thing, you know? Mm. And uh, that's just um, a part and parcel of the, uh, the Christian walk in general because, I mean, that's part of life, but also because we are representing Christ in this world, we kind of have a target on our backs so the enemy is more incentivized to throw some chaos at our way because he doesn't want us to do the will of God in this world. So, um, you know, everybody has to deal with unexpected things flying at them. But if you are, if you're, if you're living for Christ in this world, you've got a target on your back and the enemy especially wants to throw some stuff at you. So the idea of being ready for things that you don't expect or things that you didn't think would happen is, uh, yeah, it's an important thing for our walk. Yeah. As well as, um, you know, don't make it harder than it has to be. You know, don't throw yourself into situations that you know are going to trip you up. Um, the Bible talks about don't be a stumbling path. Don't be a stumbling block in another person's walk. But I feel like so often we're our own stumbling blocks. We do something or we go places or we start whatever it is knowing that <laughs> it's going to be a struggle for us. Um, just the other night I was talking with my wife and, um, we were kind of talking about, uh, about back when we were dating and we, we were talking about, you know, what was it about me back then that you liked or like, <laughs> and, um, it came, why'd back, you marry me, honey? <laughs> yeah. Well, what were you thinking? Yeah, what were you thinking? <laughs> um, but it, but it came up, um, how we, we talked about self-control a lot back then. And I was telling her like, you know, a lot of the times I know that if I'm in a situation and I'm, being tempted it's going to be really hard for me to say no in that situation and so a lot of my decisions um you know growing into who i am today and like through high school and through college uh was preemptive decisions of i don't want to go here because if i'm there i might make a bad choice instead i'm going to go here where i know i'm going to be closer to god or um you know we were talking about uh, we, we talked a lot about uh, physical intimacy because we decided to wait until marriage and we were talking about how like, yeah, it's not going to be a good idea for us to be behind closed doors together because physical temptations take over. You know, it, it's a, a big thing and it's much, it's much more honoring to God and it's much, um, much, much easier on our walk as Christians to instead put ourselves in situations where we're set up to succeed. Sorry. I just had some coming to my mind. That's why I made that face. <laughs> he stopped what I made. I was like, Oh, um, I, I, I want to tell a story. I'll tell it later though. But, um, something I've realized, uh, about was it, whatever it's not called not falling into temptation is a lot of what Jesus talks about. And it just hit me is, you know, you hear about, oh, in a conflict situation, you want to be a de-escalator. You want to de-escalate as much as you possibly can. I know that's something I was taught in, in my line of work and just a lot of things in life in general. You know, you don't want to egg somebody on is the simple way of putting it. But I've realized in dealing with sin, a lot of it is about de-escalation. A lot of it is removing obstacles out of your own way, out of your own path that you may stumble to de-escalate your chances of falling. I mean, literally, like if you have a, like a certain issue, maybe you should take that certain thing out of your way or not use a certain thing to, so that you will be, so, you know, so you won't be tempted to do that. And from what I've heard just by reading and doing research and reading scripture is a lot of it is just having a lack of access to, things that'll stumble you away, you know, and the lack of, Oh, the lack of, um, I, I, I totally lost my train of thought. I apologize. Um, yeah, I, I've also heard the analogy of, you know, if you're walking by and you hear shouting of help, I've fallen down the well, 
you don't jump into the well because now it's two people stuck in the well. <laughs> you know, you, you have to be mindful of like, all right, let me get a rope. I'm not going to get into myself into the same situation mm, you're in, yeah. but I will help you out of here. Yeah. Let me get a rope. Let me get a ladder. Let me get a, a team of people here. Like, Let me get Lassie. Like, yes, we're, we're here for you. We're, <laughs> we're, we're going to support you. We're going to help you get out of there, but I'm not getting in there with you. Mm, you know? Interesting. Um, can I share a story with you guys? So I don't know why I kept thinking of this story um, when I was thinking about this podcast we're going to do here. And I, I kept thinking, I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to share it. I shouldn't share it. It's really, it's it's not the right place for it. But then like you saying that thing beforehand really stood out to me and made me realize why I need to say it. And it has to do with another student I've been working with for years um, I won't say the name obviously, but she's an older lady. This is a different student, by the way. And she's like in her eighties. She's like this old Filipino woman and she's like super short, but she's awesome. I love her so much. In fact, I worked with her today, but one time she told me, and this was just out of the blue, out of nowhere. It was like a couple years ago. I was working with her on the computer on the, in the computer lab and she, we were working on her assignments or whatever. And she, you know, she has trouble using like, the computer in general. So I'm like helping her, guiding her, pointing the things for her to click on or just clicking them myself sometimes. Um, and that's something I also struggle with teaching just people in general. It's like you want to do it for them, but that's not how they're going to learn. So you have to be patient and you have to take the time to be with them. <laughs> that's just part of it. So I was doing that and I always have the students, you know, do it themselves. But we started talking about her, like her experience in the hospital and I do want to bring up a disclaimer before I go forward, people listening. It is, what I'm going to say is a little graphic, so and it has to do with abortion, so just be aware of that. So <laughs> she was telling me her experiences in the medical field, and she's worked at Enlo, she's worked at all these other places, and she's been a nurse for like 30 years at just various different um, states and all this kind of stuff. And what you brought up tonight, Stephen, was being Jesus to others in a place where is there is no Christ, basically. There is no God, uh, or there is no, there's no, people don't have room for him there. Uh, one point in her life, she was working, and she's a devoted Catholic, she was working in uh, an abortion facility. And she told me one time when she was assigned to this place, she, you know, immediately felt uncomfortable, didn't want to do it, but she did her job anyway. And she was in charge of, uh, going through and disposing of the bodies. And it is just something she had to do. And she is a devout Catholic. She loves God. And we talk about God all the time from time to time. And she told me that, yeah, you know what I would do I would take the little babies and I would hold them in my hand. I was like, whoa. And she would hold her hand over them and she would pray for them in the middle of this like back room of this facility. And she would like do like Mother Mary full of grace and everything to those little babies. And I was like aghast and completely blown away when she was telling me this. And I was like, like borderline almost started crying. And then I don't, cry a whole lot with stuff like that. But I was like, Oh my God. And she's like, and she was like, yes, but you know what? That's just part of life. I went there. I did what I had to do. And then I left. And you know what? Those babies, I, I blessed them each and every one. And I was like, Oh my God. And I was just like, and I remember hearing that. And it always stuck with me just years ago when she said it, but it, it, she truly was being, just being Christ-like, to uh, being Jesus to others in a place where they didn't want him at all. And so I just, I don't know why, I just felt like I needed to share it. And I think that kind of exemplifies what, you know, just being Jesus to others in a place where, you know, they don't want him. So. Well, it's um, it definitely um, highlights the... The fact that sometimes 
uh, we're going to be in situations where we can't do as much as we want. Like, you know, you guys working in the educational field, that's a, le a less extreme example than an abortion facility. But <laughs> yeah. it is an example of that. You know, there's times where... There's a place you can't talk about it. Yeah, there's yeah. times where you can't do as much as you like or say as much as you like. Um, and that really extreme example of it kind of highlights a, the need to just, in whatever situation you find yourself in, what you can do is what you can do. Um, so the better prepared, the more time you spend with the Lord in your day-to-day, -day, the more time, uh, the more intentional you are, the better prepared you're going to be in those moments where, you know, there's maybe you can only get out one word to somebody um, and it can't be Jesus before you never see them again. And so it's like, you got to, got to make good use of those opportunities. Yeah, cool. So like, like that lady, like that lady was, you know, she didn't, she wasn't in a position to intervene and save those babies lives. But at the same time, she could have easily been like, you know, fall into despair and it's like, well, then I guess I just won't do anything. But she didn't do that. She did what she could. She prayed for, she prayed for those babies because, you know, um, I mean, we generally, uh, we as, we as Christians believe that, you know, when some, when a, a child dies that young, you know, you know, God takes them back, you know, they're not sent to hell or anything like that. But it's like, so it's like, you know, in the moment, she's like, she did what she could. She prayed for those babies, and she was content to do that because she uh, trusted God with, uh, you know, with the rest. She trusted God that those, the the spirits of those uh, slain children were going to return to the Father. And uh, so she was happy to be able to do what she could, and she didn't spend a whole lot of time worrying about what might have been and all that. And I think that's important, you know. There, sometimes you're not going to be able to, you know, give someone the full gospel. And the temptation is to, you know, like, like worry about that. Like, you know, oh man, I wish I said this. Oh man, I wish I said that. You know, sometimes it's just doing what you can, being prepared, doing what you can, and then giving the rest to God. And also like... Uh, look at what Jesus did in the Bible. I mean, he didn't have a chance to say everything in Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that they wrote about at one point. He had to slowly but surely introduce it to the disciples and lay down the foundation for his, uh, for his leave and then return for the resurrection and all this kind of stuff. And it's, I would just point if people struggle with, I don't know if I do enough in my life to be Jesus to others or something like that. What I would encourage you if you're listening is to just look at Jesus as an example, even if you're not even a Christian, just look at that story and it's freaking awesome. <laughs> God is so good. And the example he shows in that is, I mean, it's the reason a lot of people believe in him, to be honest. Uh, what do you got, Stephen? Yeah. We, we also have to realize that we're always going through proving grounds. Like we're, we're always, in the mission field. Um, First Christian church in Orland, they, they have a sign right above the door as you're leaving the church that says you are now entering the mission field. Oh, right. <laughs> and that's and, so and if that, if that's not going to put, put a thorn in your heart, like it, mm -hmm. uh, get you motivated and I don't know what will, but mm. you know, it's true. You don't have to be across the world in Timbuktu to be a missionary. <laughs> yeah. You could be in the grocery store and be called to evangelize as someone. You know, yeah. I, I, I always <laughs> thought of the youth group as this is my mission right now. I am mm -hmm. on a mission right now for these teens. Whether it be 30 kids that show up that <coughs> night or four. Right. <laughs> yeah, we go on a field trip to the water park and we have three vans full yeah, of three vans full of children. <laughs> and then we have a work day the next week with two. Yeah. And they're the pastor kids, you know. Yeah, it's like um but that's that's 
it's so tempting to be like, oh, I'm in a small church. I mean, we all go to small churches, but it's so tempting to be like, oh, I'm not in a mega church. I'm not in a big city where I can make a difference. No, no, no. You're probably where God wants you to be. And as long as you stay attentive to his word and where he wants you to be, he's going to do work with you there and work in you as well. So you, you got to stay vigilant and stick to your guns and stick to the Holy Spirit of where where he wants you because you're doing exactly what he wants you to do right there. I mean, I mean, heck one, we, what was two weeks ago, David, we had like 10 people total show up at church and you know, sometimes it's tempting to think of like, Oh, you know what? Why is there only so many people or whatever? It'd be cool if there's more, but that's not the point. The point is being, I don't know. What is the point being there for them, being Jesus to them, being, being faithful with the little. Being faithful with a little, that's um, it. It's the uh, the the master that left the, the fortune to his three servants. Mm, yeah. Um, the talents. And, and did and did the t- master know exactly what each of them thought of himself when he left? Probably not. He didn't know what they were all going to do. He just left it up to them, and then he came back. Right, yeah. The Bible says that um, if you're faithful with little, you'll be faithful with much. And so D- David said it very well where he was saying, like, you can't do everything in every situation, but you have to do everything that you can because... David, you should write a book. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Snarp Fangle the novel. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, God. That's going to be so great. <laughs> but, but, but it's so true. I mean, how is... How, how are you going to expect to preach to millions if you're not ex- if you're not willing to have a coffee date with one yeah. and talk about Jesus because yeah. it's, it's going to start there it's going to start with hey what are you going to do with the homeless man that you're passing on the street right now and are you going to treat him any differently than what you have waiting for you in the future yeah, yeah and yeah, it's funny you say that. I was like, I was working with a student today who's like, like severely autistic, but uh, as I've seen him throughout the weeks, so he's gotten a little better at figuring out what he's got to do for classes. But then like, I had a guy rolling a wheelchair who's like homeless and he's like, I need your help signing up for all this stuff. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'll help you too. But it's like, like, why am I here? Like today was a for example of me thinking like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? But I'm like, eh, you know what? It's. I, I guess it's just, you know, like what you can do and everything I can for them in that moment, I guess, you know. And, you know, something to to remember is um, whether you are just, you know, nice to somebody or whether you uh, give them the full gospel breakdown, you're not the reason why someone gets saved. Yeah. Um, repentance comes... Uh, repentance comes from the prompting of the Holy Spirit inside the the heart of each person, and um, but the cool thing is, is maybe all you could do was be nice to somebody in a situation where it would have been easy not to be nice to them, but that the memory of that encounter can be something that God uses to get through to someone later because it, it ultimately it's not us, it's him. And he wants, he wants to, he wants to partner with us, but ultimately the work is his. And so it's important to remember that in situations where you're like, why am I doing this? Well, you don't know the effect that, you simply helping out a dude signing up for stuff is going to have because even though that's all you did, you just helped him out signing up for stuff. If he turns to the Lord later, it's going to be because the Lord uh, drew him to himself and you don't know whether that simple little encounter was one thing that the Holy Spirit used in that process to draw him. And you never, again, like you never really know who's watching you. Like that's really the truth. And I mean, we, we've talked about like, oh, you know, help this teenager and this person here. But it's also like 
you're just one stop on the path that they're on and how are they going to look back on that on that that moment you know but it's not really about hey i'm going to look back and how you they want to remember you um but it's about like you said david it's about what did you say <laughs> i don't even remember <laughs> it was too long ago <laughs> Off in the, the distant past, past. The past is in the past. Exactly. Jake, we should leave it there. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, Rafiki and the... Is that his name? <laughs> Rafiki and the Lion yeah, King? Rafiki, yeah, Rafiki. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we smacks him with the coconut. <laughs> Bam! It's in the past. In the past. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of the past, um, is, do you guys have any final things you guys like to share or say before we close with the uh, Philippians here? Anybody at any moment. Hmm. Yeah, for the viewers at home, can I issue a challenge? Yeah. Uh, If you're thinking that you're in a situation where you can't do enough or you feel like you haven't done enough, make a goal that every day you leave one person feeling better than when they walked up to you. And if you can do that, you're already showing God's love to them. Showing them that they're important and showing them that you care about them. Um, you have a challenge as well? No, I don't have a challenge. Um, you're going to go easy this week. All right. I th- <laughs> No, I think... Um, we make the audience suffer already. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I know, right? Um, yeah. No. Uh, so basically, I just kind of want to piggyback off of... Uh, what Steven said and just kind of like share a little quote that, you know, it's, it's helpful in those situations. Um, if uh, who, I believe it was St. Francis of Assisi who said this, he said, uh, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Yeah. Can you say it one more time? Say what again? The, the, the quote. quote. The quote. I don't even remember what that quote was. No. <laughs> no, it's, it's in the past. It's, it's the in past. the past. No, yeah. Preach the gospel. Use words if necessary. Mm, amen. Amen. I'm going to end here with Philippians 3, verses 13 through 14, New Living Translation. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. And I think that's important to remember because of why we're here on this earth is because God is great. And and I know that's just a simple like way to say it, but no, like truly, like once you've lived enough life, you start realizing, holy crap, the Lord is working and you see it and you're like, holy cow, this is insane. Now in other areas, you might be like, I want to see that in this area. Don't worry, your time will come. But I just want to encourage the audience and say that sometimes it's uh sometimes it's okay to be green, you know. I don't know what I'm saying. But anyway, <laughs> I want to edit it with Philippians. It's not easy being green. It's not easy being <laughs> green, so <laughs> Anyway, we hope you uh, enjoyed this episode of the Snart Fangle Podcast. We hope you uh, enjoyed it and had a good time. We just want to thank you again so very, very much for taking your time uh, to and invest your ears listening to us uh, just ramble on and talk to you. So hope you have a good day, and we'll uh, see you later. And we hope you Snart Fangle on. Bye-bye now. <laughs>